Lord this morning. Amen. I know it's bright and it's sunny. We, we've had a lot going on today, but if we could take just a, a few moments this morning and just seek the Lord. Amen. It's so important that we we take that time to to spend with God, to not only let our requests be known to Him, but also. And I think it's important to, not that God needs it, but it's important for us to let God know that, that we care and we're searching for him and he's on our heart. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and pray before we get started. Lord Jesus, Father, we thank you for these services that we've been having, Lord, the mighty works that you've been doing, Lord. And we pray for today, Lord God, that you would touch someone, that you would put someone before us whose heart is willing and whose soul wants to seek for you, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for what you're about to do today and this evening, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to start with a couple of settings of scripture. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to grab those. They're all going to be out of the book of Acts. Um, I may be reading a slightly different translation than what you have, but, but that's okay. We're going to start out with Acts, uh, turning to chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. When you have that, please say amen. Again, that's Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Amen. And it says, At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And a devout man carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. I'm gonna go ahead and move down to Acts chapter nine. Verses 1 and 6. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whichever, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone from heaven around him. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Moving a little further to our last setting this morning, Acts chapter 22, 12 and 16. Again, that's Acts 22, 12 through 16. And a certain Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up, then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of which you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Amen. These three settings of scripture briefly touch on, you may be seated, briefly touch on the life of Paul and Paul's conversion. 
as we see here, Paul was persecuting the church. He was a man fervent in his beliefs. Uh, Judaism, Jude, I'm going to mess the word up. Judaism, he was a devout Jew. And those folks that were coming to Christ, he was rounding him up. He had a zeal that he thought, it, it's not right for you to be preaching something other than God. And so we see that Saul of Tarsus was probably the most unlikely of candidates to become a figure in the New Testament. He had reached so much havoc, as we read on the church. People had a hard time believing that this Saul, or Paul, if you will, could, could be a changed man. They had a hard time believing, look, we know who he is. He was there when Stephen was martyred. He held the cloaks of the people that were killing Stephen. He had commission to round up people. He had a zeal to take out Christians in Jerusalem. So now you have these believers saying, wait a minute, I don't, I don't know if this guy is for us. They had a hard time believing that Paul could be something other than what he was. We read in Acts chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much harm has he done to your saints in Jerusalem? And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who come on your name. I would for a minute that we would take just just a second and take a time trip through our memories. How many of us that have been saved and been filled with the Holy Ghost, how many of us remember who we were before that life-changing moment? And for some of us that, that haven't received the Holy Ghost, that, that haven't had that experience yet, we still know that we need something, that there's something in need. I can look back on my life and and slow changes through the years, I can honestly tell you I'm not the same person that I was 20 years ago. Changes have happened. Things have, God has allowed things to be worked out in my life. And sometimes things take time. Sometimes changes happen rather quickly. If we look at Paul's resume, we, we see that, again, he, he was solidly Jewish. He was devout in his faith. He had a conviction that, that he believed in so much that he was willing to step out and, and go to the ends of the earth for what he believed, to, to round up those who he thought was in opposition to everything that he held true. We read in Philippians 3, 4 through 6, re referring to Paul, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. You see, at this point in his life, he thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was doing what he should be doing in the eyes of, I'm doing this for my Lord. There are people that that aren't the same as us. In Acts 22, 3 and 5, we read, I am a Jew born of Tarsus of Sicilia, but brought up in this city under Gamaliel. I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was, a je and was jealous for God as anyone that you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the council can testify. Even I obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. You see, at this time in his life, Paul was on fire for God, but... He didn't have the truth yet. How many of us believe that we can be on fire for the things of God, but not fully understand where we're walking or what we're walking in or the authorities that we have? I know that because I, I remember being a young man and being a young Christian and, 
and, and coming to God and thinking, man, I got this all figured out. Well, life journeys took me on a different path. I, I ended up in, in some trouble and some things because I thought I had it all figured out. So being on fire for God or having a zeal for God is not always the same as walking in truth, church. We have to be careful to, to guide our hearts and guide our minds and follow the way that we should. And sometimes we might not always know that way, but it's important that we read our Bibles. It's important that we come to services and hear the man of God preach. We must take that time. Amen? So I ask you, what are the possibilities that Saul could ever have changed? A murderous man, a, a zealous man, a man that had fire so fervent in what he was to, to take out what was in opposition to what he believed. To be quite honest with you, the, the, from a human perspective, the chances that Paul could change and become who he was from Saul to Paul were pretty low. Except for one thing, church, and that one thing is the God factor. And that's what I'd like to speak to us today about, just for a few moments, is the God factor. You see, what, what we seem or we deem as impossible, God can make possible. We read in Luke 18 and 27, Jesus replied, what is possible with men or what is impossible with men is possible with God. That is the God factor, folks. That is what we can't do. What can God do in our lives? How can he shape us? How can he mold us? How can he change us and take us from who we were to who he wants us to be? Through Jesus Christ. As we heard last evening, if you were here for service, the power of the blood. That power of the blood is the God factor. It's what changes who we are. And I, I hate change, church. My wife can tell you that I don't like nothing changing. I will come home and my wife will have something rearranged or changed around in the house. And I'm like, why? It was good how it was. And she'll tell me, well, it was time for a change. As my mind's freaking out of, why is that over there? It should be over here. But the point is, change is at sometimes inevitable. But also, change is required. Change is required. And it is the God factor that allows you and I to change. It's God working in us, through us, and everything around us to help us to change. And I slowly, like I say, I've, I've changed over the years. I'm not the same person, and I still need to change a lot, to be quite honest and transparent with everyone here. I'm, I'm human. I make mistakes. I have faults. And God's still working some things out, and Brother Joe a lot, and I think, I'm thankful for those pressing down because I need that. I need to stay in the word, but change is, like I say, it's, it's inevitable. It's something that we, we all need, and I, I could never have changed without the revelation of Jesus Christ, without having my mind made up and having someone bring the revelation of who God was to me. Lord forbid I would have stayed that same broken, wretched person. I still would have had bitterness, strife in my heart. I still would have had hatred towards people in my life that had done wrong to me. And I, I still struggle sometimes with thoughts and anger. You know, sometimes anger wants to rise up in me, and I, I have to put it down, church. I have to set those things aside. And when that rises up, the most important thing for me to do is get into the Word of God. And the number one thing, church, that I love about reading and searching the Bible, is it puts a mirror in front of me. It puts a mirror right there, so everything I see is looking back at me. So when there's things that rise up in my life or things that are going on, I need to get in the Word of God so it can be reflected and God can pull some things out of me so I can see what it is that's rising up. Sometimes we can know what our problems are or what our issues are. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper and and do some soul searching. And that happens through the word of God. Because if we can find the root and pluck up the root, chances are it's something that is a lot less likely that's going to 
grow back and rise back up in our lives. Amen? So we see Saul becoming Paul, and we see that he has this revelation in Damascus in Acts 9, 3 through 6. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And again, he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And in that next verse, it says, So he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? How many have asked us, God, what do you want from me? I'm pretty sure that most people in this building have had a moment in their life where they've, just like Paul here, have had a come to Jesus moment, for lack of a better term. Lord, what is it? What do you require of me? What is it that you want from me? What do you need me to do? And I would say that if Jesus could reveal himself in that way to Saul, then he could most assuredly do the same for us today. Is there anything too difficult for a God that can stretch across time and space and reach down to who we are and say, you know what, Brother Godfrey, I see you where you are, and I want us to work it out together. You see, church, the solution or the answer most often from God comes in an unexpected way. In my life, I've never, and I can only use my life as an example, and I've, I, or I've seen it in other people's, but in my life, God never seems to answer things in the way that I think he should. It's never a linear path. I'm, I like point A to point B. I like straight lines, brother. God in my life never works that way. He sees all these other branches and he brings them in together in line that I could never have seen. An older gentleman, a wise man that I have confidence in and that I talk to a lot, when things are going on or I see a situation and we're talking, he says, well, but Brother Joe, did you ever think about this? Or did you ever see it from this point of view? And to be quite honest, the answer is no, I didn't. With whatever reason or whatever I was going through, I didn't see it from that point of view. So I love having the confidence of having elders to come to and people that are established and are more established than me in the faith because they, they help me to realize things that, that I can't realize. And as a church body, that's so important for us to be able to do. Amen? Having somebody to go to that, that might have a different perspective or an outside perspective of what's going on. Always, always, the Lord's answers to my situations have been unexpected. So I would ask any of us here today, or all of us here, how many of us have family members or loved ones that are away from God? Yeah, quite a few hands, right? Hard to see them going through what they're going through, right? Especially when it's your child. In my case, I have a, I have a child that I love dearly. See, but what God showed me as I was studying for this lesson was I got to stop telling God how to save my son. I got to stop saying, God, you need to do this and God, you need to do that. Because quite frankly, I'm not God. But most importantly, I don't see what God sees. I have no power to bring my family members to Christ except for the one thing that they get to see who I am and how I've changed. They get to see the fact that I know my dad's praying for me. I know he, he's not the same man he was when I was growing up and he was a mean drunk. They see the changes and that's, that's amazing. So what I have to do, what we have to do when we have that friend or family member is sometimes we just have to step back for a second and say, uh, I got to let God do what God has to do. I can't push the time clock forward. I can't push the time clock backward. I can't change what already happened. And I have no ability to influence the future except for just being in the present right here, right now. 
You see, what I needed to do and what I have to do daily and continually is recognize that the solution to the equation or the solution to the problem that I, going, that I am going through is the God factor. I have to let God do what only God can do and sit back and be in marvel and be amazed and give God glory for that. Amen? Amen. We see Paul going from persecutor to preacher of the gospel. And along with that transition and that conversion and him moving forward in that walk, he, that zeal that he had that was against the people of God, against the followers of Jesus, slowly started to shift. His paradigm shifted to where that zeal became such a zeal in his conversion that he had no, he couldn't contain himself. He had to go tell somebody else. He had an obligation that he felt, said, wait a minute, if God did this to me, if, if God changed my life, if, if God brought me out of this, then I have to go tell someone else. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 and 16, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Also in Romans 1 and 14, I am obligated both to Greeks and to non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. I had the opportunity during outreach to speak with a lady and she made a statement to me. It says, yeah, I know, I know about God and I know about the Bible. She goes, I've read it and you hear about the miracles that happen. You hear about the fantabulous stories. I don't think God does that today. I don't believe that, that God does miracles in this day that we live in. So I had the opportunity to say, okay, well, wait a minute. God opened the door for me to be a testimony to her. I seen my children lying sick in a hospital with MRSA infections and the doctors telling my family, my wife and I, your son's going to die. There's nothing that we can do for him. And folks came together in prayer and they laid hands on my son and I had someone in my life, I had fellow followers that took the time to come to my son's bedside and pray over my son. And glory to Jesus, my son was healed of that infection that the doctors had no solution for. You see, the solution to that problem in that moment was the God factor. Amen? Amen. We talk about miracles and God doesn't do that. He does. Myself laying in a hospital bed after a surgery that went wrong, feeling pain and not knowing what was going on, driving myself to the emergency room and sitting there and the doctors coming in and doing blood work and coming back to me and rushing me off to surgery and saying, who's your next of kin? And they call my wife and my mom to come to the hospital. They do emergency surgery on me and they put a pick line into my heart with antibiotics. I mean, I don't know much about the medical world, but folks, when the doctors take a line and they go directly to your heart and they're pumping antibiotics on a machine for 10 days, twice a day into your body, you know that something's wrong. And the doctor's standing back and saying, we have no ability to heal you. But Jesus can, and Jesus did. To say that God doesn't do miracles anymore, I was heartbroken for this woman, but I thank God that I had the opportunity to come before her and share with her just a small thing of what God has done for me. But as I was talking to her, and I was a little bit, to be quite honest, I was happy that I got to share my testimony, but I was a little taken back by it. It kind of, it ruffled my feathers a little bit to hear someone say, what, God doesn't do that. So I had to step back for a second. I had to let my zeal in the moment settle down just, just for a little bit and come back and say, okay, Lord, wait a minute. Lord, what would you have me to do? It's a question that we have had to ask ourselves so many times. And what came to mind in that moment was that I had to remember that every single person that I have the pleasure of coming into contact with is a candidate for change. Every person, no matter where their stature, no matter who they are, no matter what my notions are, preconceptions of this person are, everybody is 
a candidate for change. We read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. This is the NIV translation, so it may be different than what's on the screen. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. That's the God factor, folks. That's the factor that no matter where we are, who we are, what situation we find ourselves in, God can change us and bring us out of that circumstance. If God can heal my son in the hospital and the doctors don't know what to do, if God can heal me and the doctors don't know what to do, he can do that for you, church. He can do all of that for you. Because God has the desire, the want to turn the tables around. He wants to take what we've given away. He wants to take what the devil has stolen both because we can give our birth right away. We can give away what God has given to us. That's, that's within our ability to do, right? But we can also have things stolen and taken from us. But the God factor desires that things get turned around for us. You see, he brought Isaac back from near death by providing a sacrifice in just the right time. And I love the timing of God, folks. His timing is impeccable, and it's something that I can never equal or match. And it, it always amazes me. I get in my mind, I just think about it when I say, man, that was God. And we look back, and we have those ability to see events in our lives and family members. And when God steps in at the right time and the perfect time, we see that ram in the thickets. Had it had been there any sooner, it would have died, and it would not have been viable for a sacrifice, right? It would already been dead. Just in time, sacrifice. You see, we also read, if we, we look at some of these stories, and we see that a humble Mordecai was elevated by a haughty Haman. Haman wanted to have his way and, and seek and deceive, and we see that Haman was actually hung on his own gallows that he had made for Mordecai. The tables turning, we see that a prayer meeting was held for Peter when Peter was in prison. Prayer meeting held for Peter. That's something we should do more often, church. I personally, and I can't speak for anybody, I, I just, in my feeling, and this is maybe just in my life, I don't know, do I pray enough? Sometimes I feel like I just don't pray enough, and as a body, we should pray more, continually praying, always praying, whether it's picking up the phone or, or, or whatever. I, I love the men's chat when guys reach out and say, hey, I have a need. I, can you pray for me? This is going on because it encourages me to not only help pray for someone else, but a lot of times someone will mention something that maybe I'm dealing with a little bit, not the exact same, but in a similar way. And I know that that's the God factor reaching out. And I love how God does that. So we see Peter in prison, and we see the church coming together and having a prayer meeting for Peter. And we read in Acts 12 and 7, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. You see, I don't think Peter expected to be released from prison the way he was released But he was. We see the, the saints of God gathering together and bringing their petition before God and praying with a ferventness and a passion that compelled God to move in a situation. And I, I don't know. I've, God probably would have moved anyway in however way he wanted to. But in this moment, God was released to move in that situation because people came together and their petition was strong and brought up before the Lord. But I find it interesting that if we read a little further down in that same chapter 12 of Acts that we have the people that are in the house, the prayer meeting, and they're praying, and they prayed for Peter, and then 
they get a on their door. What? Who is it? Oh, it's Peter. And I'm paraphrasing this here. No. <laughs> I love this. They pray for Peter to be released, and they're praying for him to get out of prison. And here all of a sudden they get a knock on the door, and the, and the guy that answers the door said, Hey, Peter's here, everybody. And they're like, No, nah, that can't be Peter. Right. Why do we do that, church? Why do we pray for something and, and give it to God, set it at his altar, take the time to put it there, and then say, Lord, you answered my request. Maybe. Or no, you couldn't have answered my request, God. That, that, that wasn't true. You didn't answer my prayer. You didn't open that door for me. You didn't heal me of this, or you didn't do that. Why do we do that? I, 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 yeah, right? Exactly. Human nature. There's just something about us that, quite frankly, we question everything. We're, we're, we're designed, we're meant to question things. And I just... It, same thing when, when they were, were they were in the boat, right? And then Jesus is telling them, you know, hey, the winds are calm. This is who I am. And then what is the first thing they do? Is they question, what? We question. God wants to put a miracle in our life. He does the miracle. And then we step back and say, wait a minute. I'm going to question you, God. Shouldn't we be more like, well, A, thank you, Jesus, very much. I appreciate it and go running. But who am I, Lord? Who am I that you would take the time to answer my petition who am I that you would answer me? I'm nobody. But with Jesus, I'm somebody. See, church, at times I think we have to stop telling God how to solve our problems and believe that he will solve our issues. See, this is the God factor, is letting God do what only God can do. And we need that in our daily lives, church. We need to have God working in our daily lives. And God, the factor of God, the solution to our problems, turn the tables. I'm kind of an analytical person. Sometimes I like to read and I like to look at some things. I like to ruminate and, and think about it. And, I did well in school because I was always able to read books and, and grasp what they were talking about and then take a test and be really, you know, get A's and B's on the test and then turn around and three weeks later data dump everything I learned. Give me something new to learn and then forget about it. How easily do we forget, church, what God has done in our lives? Those miracles that he did when we were 13, 10, 12, 14, 15, some of us that are of a riper age, you know, in their 60s and 70s, do we remember what God did for us when we were 20 years old? Do we remember what God did for us when we were 30? If the God factor is a part of our daily lives, then we will always remember what God did for us because we'll see the small miracles that God is doing and is doing every single day, the little miracles. Yes, the healings are great. Yes, the conversions are great. It's all great. The big things of God are wonderful, and we love to see them, but... What about the small things? I woke up with breath in my lungs today. I woke up with the ability to get up and breathe, and God gave me enough grace to have another day. Thank you, Jesus. So some ways that God can turn the tables for us as we're going through this situation. The first one I would say is to be still. We must stand still when the enemy is closing in on us. And I know that sometimes to, to be still and to let God is, is a very hard thing to do. And I can say that because it's hard for me sometimes to do. Just say, okay, Lord. I know that things are pressing me down. I know that this situation and that situation and the waves are coming against me and crashing down. So being still is hard. And we read in Exodus 14, 13 through 14. Again, that's Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show to you today. 
For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Standing still is a hard thing to do when the enemy is pressing and pushing. You see, church, God calls us sometimes to stand still, even when what's going on would cause us to run away. I find it interesting that a lot of times when folks come and they're in the church for a while or however long and troubles come, the first thing they do is pick up and run out the door. And I know because I was one of them. Some things were happening in my life and I wasn't able in my situation to see through it all. Well, quite frankly, I didn't let the God factor work in my life at the time. I didn't. So I picked up and I ran out the door and I said, I'm not doing this. And what happened slowly, day after day, month after month, sliding further and further away from God, things rising up and creeping up and it was pushing me away till the enemy had me so bound in my own mind that I couldn't see that the church didn't do anything to me. The saints of God didn't do anything to me. The pastor certainly didn't do anything to me. The men of God were still praying for me. I had men of God still praying for me and my soul and my family, but I was so bound up because I had walked away and ran away that I couldn't see it. I had ran away and hid behind a wall. Church, when it comes, we have to stand still and let the God factor work in our lives. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 17 says this. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will always be with you. See, we have to be still sometimes and let the God factor work its thing, work its way. Be still and hang out and let God do what God is going to do in God's timing. The same would be true as if I said, okay, Lord, you're going to do it, and I believe you're going to do it, and then I run out and try to run around God and do it myself. Where would that get me? I'm writing the math equation. You know, if some of us that do algebra A squared plus B squared equals C squared and the Pythagorean theorem and geometry and all this thing, in that setting, if I took out B, could I ever get to C? No, I mess up the equation. If I take God out of the equation, then where am I? I'm standing here with a bunch of problems that I have no ability to solve. I have to leave God written into the equation. We have to leave God written into the equation, church. The second way to, to stay in that and let God be the equation is in prayer. We have to be prayerful. We have to stay prayerful. We have to stay prayed up. I like how in Daniel chapter 9 that they give three steps to getting God's attention. In Daniel 9 and 19 it says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Pray believing that the Lord is going to hear us. Secondly, if there's anything in us that we need to be forgiven of for, make sure that we're forgiven of those things. Ask God to forgive us and sincerely with a sincere heart. Lord, if there be anything in me, Lord, take it out. And then thirdly, oh Lord, hearken and do. Stand fast. Be still knowing that God is going to do what you asked him to do. Amen. I wish that so many of us would be able to be like Jacob. If we go back and we, you know, we can read that story of Genesis, the story of Jacob, there's a lot there, and I encourage you to pick up your Bibles and read it, search it thoroughly. I'm just going to touch on a brief moment, but be like Jacob and hang on. Do not let go. Hold on until you get what God has for you. Genesis 32, 24, and 26 says, So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that 
He could not overcome him. He touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wretched as Jacob wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. Don't let go until you get your answer, church. Don't let go until you put God in the equation and let the God factor work in your life. And I'm, I'm coming to a close here. Jesus told us to keep knocking. And, and we can find that, that setting in, in Luke chapter 11. What he means by keep knocking is keep praying. Keep praying and don't let go till the solution that God has for you is revealed in your life. Amen. And I'm, again, I'm coming to a close. So if we could all stand. Church, it might be time for some of us to finally get to the point to where we learn that we can't carry the issue any longer. We can't solve the problem. We can't solve the equation. We can't solve the situation without the God factor in our lives. So if I would say we could sit about on a limb for just a second and do the, what some people might say bizarre, why don't we start trusting God? Step out and let the God factor work in our lives. How about we put God into the solution to our problems instead of inserting ourselves as the solution? See, worrying is not going to solve anything that's coming up against this church. I could worry till I'm blue in the face. There's so many sayings and different things that they have. Worry till your hair is on fire, this, that, or the third, right? Philippians 4 and 6 says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Church, I wonder if we would take just a few moments this morning that, to let the God factor take root in our lives to raise our hands and say, God, I have a problem and only you can solve the problem that I have. Yeah, yeah. To say, Jesus, I can't change anything that's going on in my life and I need you to work it out for me. Lord, I've been trying to change this and I've been trying to change that, but I can't do it. I don't have the ability. I don't have the authority. But Jesus, I know that you do. I know that the God factor can and will change my situation. Church, these altars are open. I ask that you would please come and pray or in your seats wherever you would like, but I ask that you would just take a moment and search your hearts, search yourselves in that one situation that you're going through. Ask God to be the factor to change it all. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time, Lord God, that you've given us, Lord. Father, I pray that we would be able to seek you and search you, Lord. Lord, that we would be able to give you the petition that we have freely and let it go. Father, that as I come to your throne and let it down, that you would take it up fully and have your way, Lord. Give me the peace and understanding, Lord, to know that you've taken up my petition and that your will will be done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Again, these altars are open. I invite you to please pray. If you'd like to fellowship before service, please head downstairs.